walking right again Again Good day to you, it is I, Justin Hawkins. This is Justin Hawkins Rides Again, my YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, subscribe, sign up for the alerts. Um, today I shall be responding to some of your comments. Um, these are going to be... Oh, okay. This is the seventh episode of the comments. Wow, we've been doing it that long? It's incredible. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Um, oh, so when and how did you discover you could sing falsetto? Asks Hot Frog Animations. Uh, <coughs> well, I don't know if I'd describe it as falsetto. I just sing, you know. Sometimes it's... Everyone's got like a loud part of their range and a quieter part of their range and regardless of how wide your range is some bits are just more effective than others and that's the part of my voice that's really good at um and you know i suppose it it just uh i can belt it out in the higher register and um you need that when you've when you've got two guitars that are playing really loudly on either side of your head and a drummer behind you that that will not play softly and you don't even want him to. You just you just need to find a part where you can sing over that stuff. Um, for most rock singers, I suppose it's upper mid. For me, it's kind of the high range, really. Um, but falsetto, I think it's kind of... Uh, there's something about falsetto. The word itself means like a soft head voice. And that's not what I use. I'm basically screaming. I don't know. I think it's just... It is actually just a... a uh, anatomy really I mean some some people can sing low well I mean I can sing low I've got a few a few octaves of range but the really effective part is the high high bit and everybody's different you know thanks for your comment anyway hot frog animations um, Brendan Van Vuren says what riff or lick do you wish that you had written there's a few actually I'm going to show you some can you imagine coming up with this <laughs> That's it. That's all you need. There's another one I really loved that Slash did on the Lenny Kravitz song. Brilliant. <laughs> There's so many cult ones that are brilliant. I love simple stuff, you know. The simple stuff, I think it's the hardest to come up with. Sometimes it's the most iconic. It depends how you do it, I suppose. But uh, those guys really knew what they were doing, didn't they? How many pigeons do you think it would take to lift you off the ground, asked David Harper. I don't know. Let me have a little look and see. I'm going to just do a little bit of maths for you. Now, somebody must have calculated how much a pigeon can actually carry. So I'm just going to type that in. How much, how much weight can one pigeon carry um, they'd all have to be working together wouldn't they I suppose a pigeon can safely carry about 10% of its own body weight and the average pigeon weighs about 2.5 ounces which is about 300 to 500 grams so 10% of 500 is 50 grams obviously um, so Shit. I don't know how they would do it. Hang on a sec. I'm, now I'm going to get the calculator out. This is a good question. Um, so I'm going to go with the big pigeons. So let, let's have a look here. So, so I weigh, uh, you know, it, 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 I do fluctuate a little bit. But it's mostly it's sort of s 75 kilograms. So we'll call that 75,000 grams. Um, if I divide that by... 30 well let's say let's say 40 40 because like the average pigeon is between 300 to 500 grams so we'll go for a 400 gram pigeon um and 10 percent of a 400 gram pigeon's weight would be 40 grams so if i divide 75,000 grams by 40 it would take i think an average sized pigeons uh, it'll take 1875 average sized pigeons to lift me off the ground and take me to wherever it is I need to go. 
Um, great question. Thank you for that. Do you really think rock and roll deserves to die? Uh, no, I don't, Sam. I, uh, that was just a song title. Rock and roll deserves to die. It was, uh, it came about because um, we were looking at a band that was, some people were excited about, uh, and we were just looking at it thinking, this just looks like the worst formulaic kind of sub 80s nonsense with no, like nothing new in it. It's all just like retreads of stuff that happened just before the 90s. Um, and my brother said to me, oh, fuck, rock and roll deserves to die. And I thought, well, that's a really great expression. I'll make a song about that. Um, I think that, that some of rock and roll, when it's too derivative and too reverential to a particular thing in a band's oeuvre, you know, there, there are bands out there that only sound like one album from one band's career and no other influence has been applied to the music that they're doing. I don't think that's a good way for rock and roll to thrive and become like the, the greatest genre again. Um, it's being beaten by other genres mainly because it's not moving forwards and you need to sort of widen the, the, the field of influence to be able to make those kinds of, that kind of progress, I think. Um, so, and I was, I was making the point that if we don't do that, then yeah, it deserves to die, you know, because it's only got itself to blame. Daniel Doran says, when will you sport short hair again? You looked amazing then. Going to ape that look. Thanks, Daniel. I I wanted to have short hair soon. <laughs> Honestly, I think I'm too old to have long hair. Um, and that's no, I'm not telling, saying, f for me personally, I just feel like it, I just don't enjoy having long hair anymore. I want to have short hair. Please remark in the comments area below. Um, I just I feel more happy with it. And, you know, I had a haircut on the open fire video that I really liked. I want to go back to that. There, I've said it. What is the maximum number of chords you could cram into a chord progression without it simply sounding like you're just playing a list of chords? <laughs> that is a really good question. I think um, the chord sequence itself is of no consequence, really. If the, if the melody justifies it and threads through it, you can have a million different chords, you know? So I think a chord sequence can be as long as a piece of string. It doesn't matter how many doesn't matter how many chords are in it really it's the, the most important thing is the the melody that it, that is used to accompany um with the correct melody you can thread through an infinite number of chords and one of the great guys for doing that i think is uh, brian wilson if you listen to anything from pet sounds and you know all that stuff that was on smile as well it's extraordinary that never seems to sort of retread the same thing twice so i used to do a thing like that you're sort of playing like a, a major chord sequence like you do a g to something else to something else and then when you come back round to the g you play an e minor instead and the same melodies usually work because it's the relative minor um so there's a, a hundred different ways to skin a cat and some people do choose to do that within one song it can be done but it all depends on the melody it has to be great otherwise it's just going to be shit and you're right it will just sound like a, a list of chords especially if you basically to have a melody that follows the root of each one it won't make any sense the whole thing the bigger picture is what has to work i think thanks for that um comment electric shrapnel appreciate it remy sinclair says valve amps or modeling amps kemper etc well you know it's nice to have valve amps but it's almost like that thing where you know if you want to run a, a the nasa supercomputer you probably do need to have an it department in your house to be able to do it it's the same thing with amps really I think when, you know, this, it's glass and it gets hot and it gets fucked up and just before it dies is when it sounds really amazing. If you can get something like a modelling Kemper and find the right kind of profiles where somebody's actually got those amazing amps, they're really well maintained, they're just about to die and then they take a profile of it, it's hard to beat that um, just sonically. But nothing can rival the feeling of standing in front of an amp and having that having that battle with the sound itself, you know, the right combination of a guitar, a player and an amp can create something that modeling amps just can't. Um, I use a Kemper sometimes in, in recording um, just because uh, it's consistent. And if, if, a, if a song is subject to change later, it's really easy to dial in the same sound because it's just, it's right there. But for an actual performance, when you're standing in front of something that's 
that you're doing battle with because it's feeding back all the time and you've got to find a way to position your body to actually just be able to control it and it's it's really like i suppose it's like big game fishing or something like that you really have to lean into the experience of playing a guitar through a loud amp and nothing can actually rival that feeling when you get it right uh, or even when you get it wrong it's exciting in a different way um I, I despair when I see like bands and it happens a lot in metal. You see like a lot of metal bands that are using profilers on stage or they have their amps under the stage somewhere where they can mic them up and the feedback isn't affected by them walking in front of it. And, and the focus is very much on a consistent sound for every show. That's not rock and roll as far as I'm concerned. Live, you've got to use amps. You've got to stand in front of them. You've got to live with the consequences of that. Yes, you're going to go deaf, but it's going to be fucking exciting. Um, in the studio, I think there's a time and a place for both both approaches. Thanks for your comment, Remy Sinclair. I appreciate it. James Weir, will you ever do guitar lessons, uh, guitar lesson videos on your channel? For example, what to learn, and more importantly for me, why we learn it. Oh, good point. Love the videos. Thanks. Cheers, James. Um, well, actually, I, that's the sort of thing that I do on my Patreon. I, I have one-to-one -one lessons. I have guitar tutorials. I have all sorts of things on there. Links in the description. Um, Carvey Associates says, do you still have all those Mesa Boogie dual rectifier stacks you had back in the day? Uh, no, I have some of them, actually. Um, they're all custom made. Um, so I do have some. Um, I'm going to be changing my YouTube studio around. I'm going to move it to a different uh, room in the house and you'll see my favourite uh, of the Mesa stacks right there. I'm, I'm a dual rectifier guy. It's not just the way I walk. <laughs> um. oh, <wait. laughs> uh, yeah, I like the dual, I like the Mesa Booger dual rectifiers. Um, I, I use them because it has a slightly different kind of coloration and sonic signature to the marshals that my brother always plays i think for a while there i was playing marshals as well and they were just sort of i think it was just a bit more difficult for your ear to separate what we were both up to and and that's one of the most important things i think in in live music and also recording is to sort of be able to determine what the two sort of key players are, are doing really um especially when you have a band where it is just two guitarists and it's about the sort of, that's the sound. It's, you know, um, sometimes you get one guitarist playing with a million different amps and it's, and it's more like soundscapery, but for rock and roll music, you just want to hear what the two guys are up to. I love an ACDC record where you can turn this, turn over to the left-hand speaker and hear what, what uh, Angus is doing and the right-hand speaker to see what Malcolm's doing or vice versa. Um, depends how you, wi you wire your stereo really. But uh, that's, for me, that's one of the most exciting things about rock and roll music. Um, but to determine, yeah, to help determine in your brain who's doing what, I think, I think it's important that the two guitarists play different amps. So I wasn't really allowed to use Marshalls. I like a guitar amp that does a lot of the work for you as well, so I can run about. Um, and I don't like using effects. So Misa Boogies work, the Laney's work for me. Um, Wizards are amazing. Cornford amps are amazing. There's loads of stacks that, that do the job. Um, for that period of my career, I was on Mises, and I really loved working with those guys as well. Um, nowadays, I'm on the Laney's, the JH3000s. Um, anyway, thanks a lot for your comments. Uh, very much guitar-centric this, this week, which I appreciate. Just walking right again, again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and sign up for the alerts. Uh, watch one of these two videos. See you down the rabbit hole. Yay!